Well, it's good to be here with you guys tonight. Um, we are going to be in uh, Ezekiel chapter 8. And so if you guys want to turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel, that would be great. Um, if, if you read along with uh, the church reading, we just recently read through Ezekiel. Um, and as I was reading through Ezekiel, God definitely just really met me in several places. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so tonight I uh, just wanted to, to share with you from some of the stuff that God met me with. Um, so yeah, let's pray for, to, to God, just asking that he'll meet us in this passage. It is a, uh, a really powerful one. Um, maybe not one that's like a feel-good message, so don't be prepared for that. But it is one that's very much needed and one that I'm very grateful that the Lord's been meeting me with because it's a reality in our lives that we certainly need to hear from the Lord. Um, So let's pray, and then we will open up our study. Lord, I thank you for this passage in Ezekiel. I thank you for this book you've given to us, Lord, even though sometimes it it certainly can go over our head, I think. Um, There's so much here that you're seeking to communicate, Lord, and I just pray that through the power of your spirit, you communicate your truth tonight in power, Lord, um, in clarity, Lord, and that you would speak, Lord, as you tell us your word is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to cut down to the deepest parts of who we are. And so, Lord, I pray that your sword would, would pierce our souls, would pierce our hearts, and just expose anything that's not of you, anything that's evil. Lord, you would bring us to you May we find life in your name. Lord, we pray for this tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So a question at the outset. Um, how many of you guys have seen the show uh, Hoarders? Anyone? Okay, nice. How many of you guys are hoarders? No, just kidding. Don't answer that. Um, if, uh, if you give me a couple more years, I will probably fall into that category. I, I don't like to let go of things. I'm always like, you know, uh, I can, you know, use this later down the road, right? Um, and, and, you know, on the, on the show, it's not like um, these things just happen overnight. Like, you know, one night you decide, hey, I'm going to go grab a bunch and collect a bunch of things and, you know, put it all around the house. It's, it's kind of this slow, you know, thing that takes place. Oh, I'll keep this. I'll keep that, you know, whatever. Um, and, until it becomes just this place where it's like, uh, you know, unmanageable and almost unlivable. Um, you know, to where maybe you can't even walk on the floor. Now, these people, they do have some good taste. Uh, Marvin Martian right there, I noticed. They've got, like, this whole collection. It's pretty great. But I don't think it's worth it. Um, anyways, um, you know, this can, this can happen. And if you see the show, you know, it kind of sometimes drives people out of the house where it's like, I can't, I can't live here anymore, right? And so some people will come in and help them out and to, to make the home a place that's livable. Um, tonight, we're, we're going to see um, this take place, but in the house of God, right? And not with physical objects, but with people bringing in things that are, are not of God, with people bringing in things that are detestable to God, to where his house is no longer a livable place for him. He is going to leave his house. He is going to leave the temple because of the sins and the great abominations, as our chapter will put it. Um, of the people. And and it's a terrible, terrible thing that we see. Just to give some context of of where we're at in all this, um, if you're unfamiliar, um, Israel uh, ended up getting divided into two nations. And at this point, um, the the ten tribes, uh, I think that's the southern kingdom, they they were already taken captive by the Assyrians. And um, Ezekiel, he, he was in uh, Judah, right? And Judah was taken captive later by the Babylonians. And so you've got the, uh, I'll just put it on the screen. You've got right here, pay attention to this part. So there's three invasions by the Babylonians um, in, in Judah. And the first one took, took place uh, 605 B.C. Second one took place 597 B.C. And that is the one where Um, Ezekiel is taken captive. Ezekiel is taken from Judah, and he's brought to Babylonia. So our passage tonight is going to actually take place in Babylonia, 
But God is like going to transport Ezekiel in a vision to see what's going on back in Judah, right? Because Babylonia left some of the people of Israel um, in the land. And so they were still a, a nation, though they were conquered to a degree. They were still a nation and they had, you know, the ability to still choose to worship God or not, which we're going to see, um, unfortunately. Um, so the time period where this happens is between the second invasion and the third invasion, where our chapter is going to be tonight, um, before Judah is finally entirely conquered by Babylonia. So we'll pick it up uh, in, in verse 1. Before we get there, though, just a quick uh, uh, filling you in on what the temple is all about. Um, that's a huge topic, so we can't really go into crazy detail. But the temple was something that God gave to his people um, and, and it was never about like having this awesome building, having this awesome structure or anything like that, even though it was like really beautiful. It was always about God meeting with his people, right? God has a passion to, to know and love his creation, right? We see that at the very beginning with Adam and Eve, and, and we see that all throughout the scriptures, and we see that with the people of Israel. God um, called them to make a tabernacle and then a, a temple. And he said, hey, I want to meet with you, right? And this was how God met with the people before Christ came and, and, and made a way for us to come right into the presence of God. He, the people would meet with God at the temple, right? But when you think of the temple, realize that this is the place that God set aside for his presence, right? The, the, that's why it would often be called the house of God because he says, hey, I'm going to live there right? Not that God needed that, right? In, in the book of Acts, it says, hey, God does not live in temples made by man, right? That's not like who our God is. He is, he, the heavens cannot contain him. That's what Solomon said when he built the temple. He said, the heavens cannot contain you. How much less do you, you come and live in, in this little place built by man? But God so loved his people. He's like, hey, I want to I wanna come, right? Even though he, he had to humble himself to do so. Um, he did, right? But the tragic thing is we're going to see in this chapter is, is people just totally spurn that, what God was seeking to do. So let's pick it up. Um, let's pick it up in verse 1. Um, it says this, And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord fell upon me there. Then I looked, and there was a likeness, like the appearance of fire. Uh, and from the appearance of his waist and downward, fire. And from his waist and upward, like the appearance of brightness, like the color of amber. He stretched out the form of a hand and took me by the lock of my hair. Pretty intense. And the Spirit lifted me up, between earth and heaven, and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the north gate in the inner court, where there was a seat of the image of jealousy was there, which provokes to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the, the God of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw in the plain. Then he said to me, Son of man, lift up your eyes now toward the north, so I lifted up my eyes towards the north, and there, north of the altar gate, was the image of jealousy in the entrance. Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary. Now turn again, and you will see greater abominations. So, in this passage, God is going to give Ezekiel a glimpse into to four um, different great abominations is what, what God is going to call them. He says these are great abominations, and each time it gets worse, right? He says, I'll show you even a greater abomination and a greater abomination. And, and so he's just showing them how wicked the people of Israel has become. And, and note that this is taking place, God's taking Ezekiel, not physically, but in a vision to Jerusalem and to the temple, right, the house of God, like we said, he's taking them there and letting them get a glimpse on what is going on there, what God's people are doing there in that place, right, a place that was supposed to be holy to God, devoted to God, a place where they were supposed to meet with God and, and draw near to God. This is what's taking place. So the very first thing we see, um, 
I just want you to, to pay attention to, to verse 6. Before we start looking at the specific great abominations that he, he, he's, he's going to list, take a look at verse 6. It says, Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary. And, and if, if our hearts are, are listening to what God's saying, that would, uh, we would be like really surprised by what he just said there, right? Because that's intense, that their abominations, their sins, God's people have, have done something so wicked that it's forcing God to leave his own house, right? He's getting kicked out of his own house. Not like the people are strong enough to do that. It's by his grace that he didn't just pulverize them in a moment, right? But he, he says, hey, I can't stay here any longer. The wickedness of my people is causing me to have to leave my own sanctuary, right? And we're going to see, um, well, we won't see it because we won't read it, but uh, if you would read the next couple chapters, you'd see how slowly the Lord departs. It's not like he just leaves right away. It's actually kind of this drawn out thing, and it kind of just points to the fact of like how hesitant God, it's not like God wanted to do this, but God had to do this because of the wickedness of his people. And you're going to see it. You'll see how justified and right he was in what he does. So, so let's look at the first abomination. Um, starting in verse 5, he says, Son of man, lift up your eyes now toward the north. Right? So this is the north entrance. So I lifted my eyes toward the north, and there, north of the altar gate, was this image of jealousy in the entrance. So in the main entrance of, of the, uh, the temple, we see what God describes to us as this image of jealousy or this idol of jealousy. Why does he, he say it that way? Why does he give it that term? I think a, a great uh, passage to, to think through that is um, Exodus. Exodus 40 or 34 says this, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifices to their gods. And one of them invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice and take of his daughters for your sons. And his daughters play the harlot with their gods and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. Um, lots there, but one thing we, we need to know is that when, when God's people turn from him to false gods, God sees that literally as them being like a prostitute, right? Them, because the, the scriptures tell us, right, that the relationship that God had with the people of Israel, he, he referred to it as like a marriage covenant, right, where they made a promise to one another um, that he would be their God and they would be his people. And so when they turn from him to other gods, he's like, that's like you're, you're becoming a prostitute. You're just going around. And, 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 and so, you know, no husband in his right mind would be okay with his wife just going around and sleeping around, right? And, and so for God, that's what he sees this as. It's like, my people have turned their back on me. My people, you know, I'm a jealous God, right? And rightly so. A husband should be jealous of his wife if she's made that promise to him and he's made that promise to her. Um, and, and, and so God has that. Another passage in Deuteronomy says it this way. says they provoked him, God, to jealousy with their foreign gods, with abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God. To gods they did not know. To new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. And it says this, And of the rock who begat you or who gave you life, speaking of Christ, you are unmindful and have forgotten the God who fathered you. They have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols, right? So you see the jealousy with, with God. He's, he sees these idols in his temple, and that's why he gives it this name here, this idol or this image of jealousy because it's provoking God to, to jealousy. There is somebody, you know, people have chosen to, to serve this image, right? This, um, whatever it is, there's speculation of what specific image it is, and, and it doesn't give it to us, so it's not necessary. It's just a false God that somebody created, and they worshiping it right at their entrance, right? The first thing that people see coming into the temple is not, you know, something to remind them of, of the true God. It's a, a false God, right? And so that's the first great abomination. Um, but then he goes on 
And in verses 6 to 12, he's going to tell us of the second one. So let's read those. It says, Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, I'm sorry, I think I jumped back further. No, that's right. Son of man, do you see what great abominations that the house of Israel commits to make me go far away from my sanctuary? Now turn again, and you will see greater abominations. So he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. And he said to me, Son of man, dig into the wall. And when I had dug into the wall, there was a door. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations which they are doing there. So I went in and saw, and there every sort of creeping thing, abominable beast, and all idols of the house of Israel, portrayed all around on the walls. And there stood before them seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel. And in their midst stood Jehazaniah, the son of Shaphan. Each man had a censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols? For they say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Um, starts off by, by you know, um, Ezekiel seeing this hole in the wall, and God's like, hey, dig into that, right? And, and so he starts to dig. He finds this secret dark room where there's paintings of, of all these animals and, and different, uh, which they're animal gods that these people are worshiping, on the walls. And, and I like what David Guzik said uh, to, to the point about him digging. He says, in spiritual application, this shows that it may take some effort and energy to truly see the interior. If only an easy surface observation is allowed, the true state of things may not be seen, right? And that's a good thing for us to think about in our lives, right? If we only look at the surface, um, it, it's easy to brush over things. But what we should be doing is looking deep within our heart and asking God to look deep within our heart and show us anything that is wrong in there, right? And, and, and God is calling Ezekiel. He says, hey, dig into this. And, he, and he, he digs and he finds this door and he finds this secret room and it's this dark room, right? And these people inside there, they think, oh, nobody sees us, right? We, we, our, our secret is safe. And, and they're false and, and wrong in saying such a thing, right? The funny thing is they're saying the Lord doesn't see us, right? But they're worshiping in this moment, um, they're worshiping um, a false god, right, on the walls. And that, that, that god on the walls that's painted on the walls doesn't even see them, right? That's a, the irony of the situation, right? They're in this dark room, and, and those idols, they're, they're not real. They're nothing. And, and, and so, you know, they're, they're thinking these things, you know, we can worship and pray to, but the, the true god, he doesn't see us. He doesn't know. He doesn't care, right? He's abandoned us. And the sad thing is, the reason why they were going through what they were going through was because they had abandoned the Lord, right? And he was allowing them to, to reap what they were sowing. But they thought, hey, nobody's going to find out what's going on, right? Nobody's going to know. And Hebrews 4.13 lets us know that's not the case, right? It says, and no creature is hidden from God's sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And, and God just says it so well there. If, if we ever thought, hey, I'm getting away with this, right? I'm doing this in the dark. Nobody knows. You know, it's the middle of the night. Nobody knows what I'm doing, right? Or, or I'm at a place nobody knows of. Yeah, God knows, right? God, God knows what is going on in your heart. God knows what's going on in your mind. God knows the things that we're scrolling through on the internet. God knows all these things, right? And so for us to think, hey, God doesn't know, that's foolish. And these people think that, and that's foolish, um, and, and the sad thing is these are elders, right? These are people that the people are looking up to, 70 of them, people that they look to as spiritual leaders, and these guys, in secret, right, are actually worshiping false gods and, and praying to them and worshiping, and, and it's terrible. Um, from there, he, he goes on to the third, um, the third great abomination in verses 13 and 14. It says this, and he said to me, turn again, and you will see greater abominations that they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. 
And to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. And uh, there's not a lot of information on, on what this, who this God is um, within the rest of the scriptures, but there are some, some historical things that help us to understand what's going on here. Um, and the, the description given to us here in this passage is actually a really good uh, description of, of what, uh, what we see in, in archaeology and stuff of people weeping for this, this God, and the people believe that this God would uh, die when, like, the harvest came and, and plants were dying, and, and then they believe that it w- would rise again when, uh, when spring hit and things came back to life, and so they would mourn um, and weep when, when the plants started dying. This was a fertility God, and it was associated with a lot of, of sexual immorality and terrible things, and the sad thing is, um, these women are just, fo- you know, they're, they're not concerned about what they're doing to the Lord in his house. They're not concerned that, that they're grieving God and that the nation has sinned against God and there's violence in the land and terrible things. They're not at all, um, they're not at all afraid of that. Um, but they, they are um, concerned about this God that, that is a false God. And, um, and uh, yeah. All right. Sorry, guys, I lost my spot here. Um, one of the, you know, I was listening to a pastor, and one of the things they brought up um, is, you know, a very sad thing in this moment is, um, you know, the women of, of the country have now come to this place of, of giving in to false worship. And, and often in the scriptures, we see women being, you know, some of the first to, to be responsive to God. And, you know, they're the first at the, the tomb. They're the first um, in, in many cases where you see them come to Christ and you see, you know, them responsive to the Lord. And, and here, you know, there's just this sad state where the men have already gone off the deep end. And now he sees the women are here, you know, worshiping this false God and, and mourning over its, you know, death that, that they think happens every year. Um, then we get to the, the, the fourth great abomination, and that's in verses 15 through 18. So verse 15, it says this, Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, and you will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. There at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they were worshiping the sun towards the east. And he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, I will also act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. Um, we see this, this last great abomination, and it is just a very, very, very sad picture. But before we dive into thinking about all that's going on there, I want to just point out a little bit about um, what idols are and, and what they can be in. And in this passage, we see, you know, they can be things that people create, right? At the very entrance, you, you have this statue that somebody has created to, to represent some God, right? And the people are worshiping that, and God says, hey, that provoked him to jealousy. But right here, and actually in the, the previous, uh, the one the second great abomination, you see people worshiping animals, and then here you see them worshiping the sun, right? And, and we, we see that essentially anything can become an idol, right? Whether it's human created or something that is beautiful, something that God created himself, we can turn anything into an idol. Um, if you were reading in, in the church reading, we read First Timothy today, and I, I thought this was a, a good passage to kind of wrap our mind around that. Um, Paul speaking to Timothy, he says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty or proud, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy, right? So he, he's warning, 
He's warning those who are rich, and he says, hey, don't set your hope. Don't put your trust in your riches. Rather, put your trust in the living God and realize he's the one who's given us all things richly to enjoy, right? And so what happens when, when something becomes an idol in our life is when we take it out of the context of an enjoying a gift from God and we start to worship that gift that God has given us, right? That's what these people were doing. The sun was a, is a gift from God, right? It's something that causes life to happen in this world, um, and it's something that we can enjoy, and, and, and it was meant to be that, right? Um, as well as animals, right? And yet these people, they started to worship these things as if those were their creator, which is a completely foolish thing to do. Uh, and, and so in this passage, he, he, he speaking to, to people who will maybe would start trusting in money. He's like, don't let that become your God, right? If you're going to put your trust in money, you're going to put your life, you're going to invest your life into money, and that's what you're going to be living for. It's like, you're turning that into a God, right? Instead, put your trust in the living God. He's the, our creator, right? And he's the one who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So when we see things properly and we have God as the object of our worship, God as the object of our adoration, of our love, and then we receive the good gifts he's given us and enjoy those things, that's a beautiful balance where we, we give thanks to God for the things he's given us. We don't worship the things that he's given us. We don't make the things that he's given us more important in our lives than him. That would be foolish, right? And so the scriptures let us know, hey, that is, you know, um, when, when something even good turns into an idol is when we cross that threshold where we start to, to worship that thing or we start to love that thing more than God or focus on that thing more than God, trust that thing more than God. Romans puts it this way. It says, professing to be wise, they became fools and they traded or changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. See, the terrible thing, when people would make statues and things of God, sometimes they'd even try to be representing the true God. And God said, no, right? The first command is, have no other gods before me. And the second is, don't make any graven images, even of God, right, that are truly supposed to be representing him because he's incorruptible. You cannot represent God with some sort of idol. It just totally, it diminishes the beauty of God and the value of God. And that's why he, he says, hey, he's incorruptible, and yet these people are trading the image of God and the glory of God into this, this image made like a corruptible person or birds or animals, right? Creeping things. And he says, therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, right? He's like, if that's what you're going to do, then you be free to do it, right? You, you, I'm going to give you over to those things. In the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And it says, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And I hope none of us do that or are doing that in our lives where we're trading in the truth of who God is and we're trading it for a lie um, because that's going to destroy our lives, right? Because God is the source of life. And if we trade for a, fo a phony, a, uh, something that's not real, then it's going to bring destruction, right? And so he says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and it says they worshiped and served the creature or the created things rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And if you read the rest of Romans 1, you'll see that this describes our culture very well. Our culture has abandoned God, and they've come into all these different ideas of what God is, you know, and, you know, oh, we are all God, and the world is God, and all these things, right? Uh, and so many different ideas, but it just leads to this total immoral life that, that just ruins what God created. And, and it's because we, we're, you know, you're, you're never going to um, if, if you think God is an animal, you think God is these things, like you can do whatever you want and you're not seeing the glory of God. When you see the glory of God, that's going to change your life, right? Because you see how perfect he is and how right he is. And when you come to him, you can be changed through who he is um, and through what he's done for us. But when you reject him, it's, it's just, it, it is not going well for you. Um, and so that's what these people were doing. They traded the, the true God, the glory of God, um, and they decided to worship and serve things that he made. And so this is a terrible quality picture, but it's the only one I could find. But just imagine um, you're there, right? And God's temple is there, this place where he said, hey, I'm going to dwell so I can be with my people so they can draw near to me. And what do the people do? Imagine if the rest of the message I taught to you guys like this, right? That would be kind of insulting, right? Um, and obnoxious. Um, Imagine trying to have a conversation with somebody and, and they literally just turn around. They won't listen to you, 
right? And instead, they just turn around and focus on something else. And that's what these people are doing. They're literally right in, in that place where the temple building is, in between the temple and the altar, and, and they turn their backs on God, on God's presence, and they turn towards the sun, and they start worshiping it. Like, that's nuts. Um, it's terrible. Terrible, terrible. Um, hmm. John Calvin put it this way. He says, for what is, an, what is idolatry if not this? To worship the gifts in place of the giver himself. And that's a great description. A great description. Um, and, and the crazy thing is, is these people think it's trivial, right? They think it's like, man, big deal, right? That's literally what God says. Um, he says, have you seen this? Is this trivial, right? Uh, where are we at? That is not the right chapter right there. Verse 17, he says this, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they have committed here? For they have filled the land with violence, and then they have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. And if you just read this, like, God is so frustrated, right? And God is so offended by the way his people are treating him, right? They turn their back on him, uh, you know, just terrible uh, disrespect and disregard for all that he is and all that he's done, right? They turn their back on him. And, and in addition to that, they're, they're filling the land with violence. They're doing terrible things. They're not loving their neighbors like God told them to do, right? To love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love their neighbor as self. Those are the great commandments that God has given us, and he had given them, and they were not doing it at all. They were, you know, abusing one another in the land, and then he says, and then you return and come to my house, and you pull this kind of stuff, right? He's like, are you kidding me? right? And he, he says this thing, indeed, they put the branch to their nose, which I have no idea what that means, and I don't think anybody knows what it means from what I researched. It, people have some ideas, but one way or another, it's like these people are just totally disrespecting. Essentially, in our culture, it would probably be like these people are giving me the bird, right? These people are, have no respect for me. They're, screw you, God. I want nothing to do with you. I want to serve your creation rather than you, right? They turn their back on God. And it's terrible, and God is deeply offended. Um, and, and yet these people think it's trivial, right? These people think, eh, it's not that big of a deal, right? They're like, eh. Um, it, it, it's so foolish, so crazy. If you're reading, we read this today in our, our scripture reading, 1 Timothy, and just describing in a short couple sentences how amazing our God is, right? He says this, God, who is the blessed and the only sovereign, right, fully in control, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, master, who alone has immortality, right? He's here, Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who dwells or lives in unapproachable light. Like if you tried to come to God, you could not because he is so holy, right? Um, you couldn't come to him and see him in his full, fullness. He, he, his, his light is so bright, it's unapproachable whom no one has ever seen in his fullness or can see in his fullness. To him be honor and eternal dominion forever and ever. Amen. Right? And for these people to turn their back on God Almighty and to say, you know what, I'm just going to worship the son over here that he made. Like, that makes a lot of sense. Right? It's like, are you kidding me? And God had warned them. Right? God had said, hey, it, this is going to be something that you're tempted to do, right? He told them back when, when they had entered the land um, of Israel. He's like, you guys are going to be tempted to, to worship the sun and the moon and the stars, the things that I've given you, right? And he warned them not to do such a thing. And yet they do it here. It's terrible. Um, and, and, and it's so easy for us to see, like, how stupid these people are and how dumb what they're doing is and, and wrong what they're doing. It's very easy for us to see. Um, but what's not quite so easy for us to see is where that works into our lives, right? And, and maybe you know where this is going, but the scriptures tell us that we are the temple, right? It says, do you not know that you are God's temple? If you've put your trust in Jesus, God has come to live within you, which is crazy. But he has. He says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells or lives within you, right? And so when we, you know, before we're quick to point the finger and say, how stupid are these people? We should look back and say, what is going on in the temple that God has given me, 
right, where God is dwelling within me. If you know the Lord Jesus tonight, God lives within you, right? And so we need to ask ourselves the question, is this a place that God is comfortable living in? Like, or is this like a hoarder's house that like he can't even move around and he's like squished to the very corners because I am pushing him as far as I can, right? John Piper put it this way. He says, we make a God out of whatever we find most joy in. So find your joy in God and be done with all idolatry. And right now I want to show you a clip from John Piper. It's one um, that I saw uh, quite some time ago, probably two or three years ago, but it stuck with me all this time. It's super powerful. And it's actually him explaining a passage from Jeremiah. And if you're familiar with this time period, Jeremiah is literally in the area that Ezekiel has just traveled into this vision in, right? If you remember, Ezekiel is in Babylonia, but God has given them this vision of what's going on with the people of Judah, the people of Israel, right, in the temple. And, and Jeremiah, for the past several years, has been prophesying to the people of Israel, hey, destruction's coming, turn back to the Lord, right? Stop worshiping these false gods. And, and so in the same time period, Jeremiah was speaking to the same people group that we're looking at tonight. And, and he spoke these words to them from a different angle saying, hey, uh, my people have committed two evils. They have, have forsaken me, the, the fountain of living waters, and, and dug cisterns for themselves, empty and broken cisterns, which can not s- satisfy them, right? And so let's check out what this guy says, and then uh, we'll, we'll keep going in our study. What is evil? How would you define evil? Here is a description of evil from Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Second, they have hewed out for themselves broken cisterns. They have dug dry, empty wells, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So what's your definition of evil? Evil is the creator of the universe who loved us enough to send his son to die in our place, holding out infinite satisfaction in the fountain of living water. And we taste it and go, I don't think so. And we start digging, just digging and digging in the world. I will find it. I will find it here, not there. That is evil. That's the evil behind all evils. Murder in Sutherland Springs is not the ultimate evil. It's what was going on before and inside in relation to God Almighty that said, you don't count in my life. I will have my revenge. I will have it my way. I will do my thing to get my satisfaction, and you can take a trip, Creator. That's ultimate evil. And it yields a million other evils, like murder. And we get so worked up about murder and, and rape and adultery and stealing, and God hardly ever comes into the picture for a lot of people when defining evil. So here's my definition of evil. Jeremiah, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me. The fountain of living waters. What makes it so evil is that he is so good. I have water for you. I know what your souls need. I know what satisfies your soul. I made your soul. I know what it needs, and I'm it. And evil is no thank you. Or no. Now I will find my way and do my thing, and I will dig my wells and my cisterns, and I will suck on this dirt till I'm dead. And then I'll go to hell, and I will hate you forever. No regrets. That's evil. And it yields 
a thousand horrors in this world. Okay, pretty intense stuff, um, but very true. And definitely what is taking place in the people of Israel in this moment. Um, and, um, you know, I wonder tonight if we, if we were to take a virtual tour of our hearts tonight, of our temples, and, and maybe we were to dig a little deeper, right, down into the secret parts, the deeper parts of our hearts and of our souls. Do our hearts look like that temple that we just took a, a, a glance of? Have we elevated any of God's good gifts to the place of worship or service in our lives? Have we given in to sin in our lives and, and let that grow and take God's place in our hearts? Idolatry in, in our temple and in the temple that we just read, it has great consequences. We're going to see in, in the next uh, two chapters after what we just read, it's going to let us know that the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the temple. God leaves, right? His people had made him leave. They pushed him out of his own house. Thankfully, uh, thankfully for us, today uh, we are in a new covenant with Christ. And, and Christ told us, to, uh, told us this way. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So Jesus lets us know in this new covenant, if we come to Christ, right, and we put our trust in him and, and we receive the spirit, right, that, that won't be t- he, will, he won't be taken from us like he was taken from this temple. Um, but still, within the life of the believer, there's grave consequences for us doing what the people just did here in, in, what, in the temple, doing that in our lives. And it looks a lot different in our lives, right? It doesn't look like us bowing down to the sun, most likely, maybe, right? But most likely, it doesn't look like that. And most likely, it doesn't look like us bowing down to some statue somebody made, right? But it, but it looks a lot more like, hey, where do I spend all my time? Is all I ever do is spend time on Netflix? Is all I ever do, um, you know, uh, play video games is all I ever do. Think about my girlfriend, think about my boyfriend, think about my family, my career, my job, my money. Like, those are idols when we put those above God. Those are good gifts from God. Maybe not Netflix. I don't know about that one. But, I mean, it could be, who knows. But I'm just saying, the, the, uh, the other ones, family, relationships, those are good gifts from God, but we can turn those into idols. Um, and... Um, yeah, it can, it can be that. And it can be sin as well, you know, whether that's, you know, just any sin really essentially becomes an idol because we're serving that, we choose that over God. Um, we choose that above Him. And when we do that, when we live our lives in that way where we're, where we're choosing to, to let these idols into our hearts, choosing to let these idols into our lives, the Scriptures let us know that we can grieve the Holy Spirit who's living in us. That's what it says in Ephesians. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. It's like, don't do that. What does that mean to grieve the Spirit of God? Isn't that incredible that we tiny, finite beings could grieve the infinite God? And that's because he loves us. He's made himself vulnerable to us. That's what love does. When we are truly walking in love, we have to be vulnerable. And God in all of his infiniteness, has chosen to be vulnerable with us, which is nuts, right? And in, the, and in a sense, we can betray that relationship that he has entered into with us, and we've entered into with him. We've entered into a covenant, right? If you were a Christian here today, you've entered into a covenant where you said, God, you are my God, and he said, hey, you are my son, you are my daughter, right? And when we, we step across that line and start to serve other gods, right, even though we might not be calling them gods, but we are acting as if they were God, right? They are what we are living for. They are what we are finding our joy in. They are taking all of our time and our energy and our efforts. We are serving them with our time and our life. We're serving them with our heart. We're serving them, worshiping, right? We're betraying the Lord. And, and, and that grieves his heart. That breaks his heart because he loves us. 
So we can grieve the Holy Spirit, and we should not think it trivial to grieve the Spirit of God. Like these people thought it was trivial to turn their back on God, to thumb their noses at Him and say, eh, we, whatever. We're going to worship the Son, right? It's like, what? And yet, I think myself, I can speak for myself, like it's so easy to do that. It's so easy to just get caught up in, in, in life and just start doing all these things and totally like get the priorities all messed up and forget like he is God. He gave me breath. The breath that I'm breathing came from him and yet I'm going to use it to go spend it on all these other things rather than glorifying my maker, glorifying my savior and enjoying the life he's given me in the context of being thankful to him as my God and as the giver of every good gift. Not only can we grieve the Holy Spirit, but we can quench the Holy Spirit. And so in Thessalonians, Paul says, don't quench the Holy Spirit. It's as if God, in his spirit dwelling within us, he's trying to kindle this fire within us, this fire of his goodness and his presence and his love and his power, right? What the scriptures tell us, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. He's seeking to work these in us and start a fire in us and make us truly alive in him to make us truly the people that he originally created us to be, the, the human that he made us to be originally. And it's like we have this fire extinguisher, and we're just like, nah, you know, I'm going to do my thing, right? No, nah, I'm going to, you know, just totally vegetate on whatever and, and totally forget about you, the sovereign God, the God who... who made all things and knows all things and loves me and gave his son for me. What are we doing? I'm thankful that the story of uh, Ezekiel does not end where we just ended. Uh, It keeps going and things get more promising um, because, not because the people fix stuff. The people we're total screw-ups, which if you would raise your hand for that, you don't need to, but we could all raise our hands to that. We are all that, right? But God is not. He's perfect, right? And, and God makes a way. And so he gives Ezekiel, in the end of the, the, the book, he gives Ezekiel a new vision of a new temple that God comes to dwell in. And so in Ezekiel, after the, he gives them, hey, what this temple is going to look like and all that, it says, the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And it's just this beautiful moment where God gets to come back to his people, right? And his people get to come to him, but it wasn't because they were so great. It's because he was so great, and he pursued them, and he made a way, and we'll get to that in just a second. And this is actually where everything's headed. If you get to the end of the book, Revelations, Revelation 21, verse 4, I think, he, he, God tells us, hey, God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells, right? And then he says, and God's temple or God's tabernacle is going to be with man, mankind. He's going to live with his people. He will be their God, and they will be his people. What he's all been about since day one right, in which we so often miss, and we desperately need the Lord to shake us and wake us up to this reality of who he is and what he wants. But he has this thing that he he speaks about this new temple, um, and he says, this is the law of the new temple. He says, this is the law of the new temple. The whole territory on the top of the mountain all around shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the temple, right, in this place of holiness. it, It has the idea of being devoted, fully given to God and his purposes for that, right? And and that is what the Lord wants for our lives, right? For our temples, our lives, our hearts to be holy before him, given to him. So that's why in Romans, God will put it this way. He says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Right? He says, hey, present all of yourselves, your, your bodies, right? Present it to God. And he says, holy, right? This, this holy sacrifice to God is giving him all of us, right? The idea of holy is to fully devote, fully given unto God. And that is what God intended for the temple back then, but that is what God intends for our temple as collectively as the body of Christ. And so we should keep each other accountable for that, but individually as the body of Christ, individually as the dwelling of the Spirit of God. He wants us to walk in holiness. And there's only one 
way that this is possible, and it's actually given to us in the middle of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36. God tells us this, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all of your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And, you will, and I will remove the heart of stone from you, from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. Right? God tells us, hey, the way this is going to happen, the way God's people were going to be forgiven of their evil, of their idolatry, of all these things, is that God was going to forgive them. God was going to give them a new heart and, and, and enable them to be the people he created them to be, be the people who would follow him and walk in what he says. And so he continues in on that, and he says, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules, and you shall live or dwell in the land that I gave your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. This is a promise given specifically to the people of Israel, but it applies to us in the new covenant. Jeremiah would tie into this as well, with this idea of a new heart, right? And he speaks about a new covenant that God would give, and it's, he would forgive their sins. He would remember them no more. And, and we're let known that this takes place through the blood of Jesus Christ, right? He is the one who, who did this. And so tonight, as we close, I want to make application to our lives. There's really going to be kind of three different groups that we could be in. We could be in one of three of these groups. Could either be totally lost, totally separate from God, have not have a relationship with him because you're separated from him because of your sins, right? And that's never what God intended. That's why he made the temple. That's why he made the tabernacle, right? That's why he, Christ came to tabernacle among us. That's what John puts it. He says he came to dwell among us, full of grace and truth. He became flesh. He tabernacled literally among us or dwelled among us. Christ did that so that we could be made right with God. And so if, if you're in that spot uh, of number one, we'll get there. Uh, you could be in a place where you've been made right with God, but you've drifted from him and allow idols into your heart. Or you could be in a place where you are with the Lord, right? You've been made right with him, and right now you're walking closely to him. As Michael, Micah put it, seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God, and you're in that spot. So let's tackle each of those spots quickly, and then we'll close. If you're in that first spot where you're separated from God, this is God's word to you. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Simple as it gets, right? Jesus died. He was the righteous one. He never sinned, but he suffered as though he did, right? Christ died for us. The righteous for the unrighteous. We are the unrighteous, and he did so that he could reconcile us to God, bring us back to God, what he's been wanting all along for us to be his people and him to be our God, to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's what we were created for. Your life will never make sense until you receive him as your Lord and Savior and are reconciled to your creator. Maybe that's you, and if it is, I pray you turn to the Lord tonight. And maybe that's not you. Maybe you know the Lord, but tonight you find yourself and you look into your heart and you're like, man, what we just read in, in Ezekiel 8, like, that looks a lot like my heart. Like I have let so much stuff between me and my creator. Um, I, have, I have allowed my heart to become defiled. Um, and maybe that's where you're at. And if that is where you're at, God would speak his word to you here. 1 Corinthians says it this way, Therefore, my beloved, flee or run away from idolatry, or shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he is? Like, what are you thinking, right? You really think you could take him on? Not going to happen. Don't go that way. Run away from idolatry. James puts it this way. He says, you adulterer, uh, adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity or in making yourself an enemy of God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scriptures say, God, he yearns jealously over the spirit that ha he has made to dwell in us. But, and thankfully for the but, he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Place yourself under him. Say yes to him. Resist the devil. Say no to him. And he will flee from you. And then he says this, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, 
and he will exalt you. He said, if that's where you're at, like, come broken before the Lord and say, humble before the Lord and say, God, I've sinned, right? Draw near to him. He'll draw near to you. Seek his forgiveness. He will forgive you. He will restore you and bring you back and recognize you're not your own, right? First, First Corinthians lets us know, he says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. And then he says this about our body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God. You are not your own. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You've, you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Right? You've been bought with a price. You were not your own. So glorify God with your body. And if that's where you're at, I want to encourage you in this. When Jesus uh, came to the temple after he, he turned the water into wine at, at a, a wedding, it says this, the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there making a w- and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and he poured out the coins of the money changers and he overturned their tables and he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written in the scriptures, zeal for your house or passion for your house will consume me. Right? If you find yourself and you're like, man, my, my temple is, is full of so much stuff that shouldn't be there, then turn to Jesus, right? He's really good at driving stuff out of the temple that shouldn't be there. Ask him to do so. He will do so. And the last group, if you're like, hey, I'm doing well, like I'm serving the Lord, I'm walking with him, my eyes are on him, keep going. But be warned, First John tells us this, little children, keep or guard yourselves from idols, false gods, from anything and everything that would occupy the place of God in your heart due to God, from any sort of substitute for him that would take first place in your life. Amen. Let it be so. It's the Amplified Version, if you didn't figure that out. Um, But he's like, hey, guard yourself. Because it's just so easy to fall into this, right? And that's why the scriptures would tell us in Proverbs, Keep your heart with all vigilance, or in other passages, other translations say, um, above all else, right? Guard your heart, for out of it flows the springs of life. It's like we have got to guard this temple that God has given us, and we should guard it for the glory of God and and for his name and for his honor and, and, and keep our temple for him because we have been bought with a price. So glorify God with your temple, with your body. So we're gonna close with this verse, um, and then the worship team will probably come up and sing uh, one or two songs. I'll let them decide on that one. Um, anyways, Psalms 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And that is a prayer that we should pray tonight as God's people. Say, God, look inside my heart, right? Show me. Because just to be honest, like when, I, when I'm then thinking about this, I was like, Lord, I'm sure there's so much more in my heart that, that I have no clue about that is not pleasing to you. That is, that is idolatrous, right? Um, and I think human relationships can be such an easy one that becomes idolatrous because it's such a good gift from God, right? Whether that's a boyfriend, whether that's a girlfriend, whether that's a spouse, whether that's your kids or friends, it can be so easy to elevate human relationship above God because it is such one of the greatest gifts God's given us. So watch out. Whatever that is, I don't know what those things are. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's so many other things that it could be, right? I don't know, but God does. So ask the Lord to search your hearts this evening and show us anything that shouldn't be there and lead us in the way everlasting. So I'm going to pray. Worship team is going to come up, and then we'll close. Lord, um, I pray that you would open our eyes. We would not be blinded like the people in the passage we just read about in Ezekiel 8. So blinded, so so very off, thinking, oh, it's no big deal that we, we thumb our nose at the God of the universe, turn our backs on him, serve his creation rather than him. Foolishness, Lord. And yet we are so often so guilty in, in that same place, Lord. I am. And so, Lord, I agree with this psalm. Search us, Lord. Know us. Try us. See if there's any evil things within us. Maybe fear is an idol. The anxious thoughts within us. Maybe so many different things that could be an idol within our life, Lord, and you know. And so I pray that you, through the power of your spirit, would pinpoint that in our lives and remove it. Jesus, you uh, uh, drove out 
the, the wickedness from the temple more than, on more than one occasion, Lord, and I know that you are able to do so within the lives of your people and in the community of your people, and so we pray for that here, Lord. Would your spirit fall upon your people so that we could see your power in our land. We could see your healing in our land, Lord. We cry out for this, Father, and we realize that you are our only hope. And we pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.